There are two different types of filters that are used in digital signal processing. One is called FIR and the other is called IIR. We're going to explore those in this lecture. So FIR is an acronym that stands for Finite Impulse Response, while IIR is an acronym that stands for Infinite Impulse Response. The reasons for these acronyms can be seen in a variety of ways, but we'll start by looking at the difference equations that describe the outputs of these filters. So in an FIR filter, we express the output at time n, y of n, simply as a sum of weighted values of the past input. This is also sometimes known as a moving average. In an IIR filter, in contrast, we have recursion. We not only have the past inputs, a weighted combination of those, but we also have a weighted combination of the past outputs. And this is where one gets the infinite nature of the impulse response, because these recursions where present value of y depends on past values of y will last in theory forever in terms of the impulse response. In the FIR case, the system function can be described as h of z is the sum k equals 0 to m bk z to the minus k, while in the IIR case, we're going to have h of z is the sum k equals 0 to m bk z to the minus k. We have this numerator term. We also have the denominator polynomial in z inverse, which is the sum k equals 0 to n a k z to the minus k. And in this notation that we're using here for this particular difference equation, we're assuming that a0 is equal to 1. The FIR filter has zeros, and then the only poles that the FIR filter has are at z equals 0, whereas the IIR filter has both poles and zeros in arbitrary locations. So we have a lot more flexibility in terms of the types of systems that we can accomplish with an IIR filter than we do with the FIR filter, because here we're only allowed to place zeros, whereas we can place both the poles and the zeros in the IIR case. So if we take the inverse z transform to find the impulse response, we find that for the FIR case, the impulse response is given by these coefficients in the weighted sum, the bk's, so h of n is equal to b sub n, before n between 0 and cap m, and it's 0 otherwise. Hence the term finite impulse response, because this impulse response dies out after capital M terms. Now, the IIR case, if we expand this system function in terms of a partial fraction expansion and then do an inverse transform and pick the causal parts, we obtain an impulse response that takes the form the sum k equals 1 to n a k d k raised to the nth power u of n. And this form is also assuming that all the dk's are distinct. It really doesn't change our interpretation if they're not distinct because the important observation here is that we have this geometric sequence dk to the n and that in general never becomes exactly zero. So this impulse response does decay but it never goes exactly to zero and hence the name infinite impulse response. We can further contrast these two types of systems by drawing Bach diagrams which represent the difference equations here I've got the FIR case where I'm representing the output y of n is a weighted sum of past values of the input. So we're going to have x of n as the input and I'll use a block z inverse to represent a unit delay. So the output of z inverse will be x of n minus 1 and then I'll have another block to represent x of n minus 2 and then finally enough blocks that I obtain x of n minus m. So another way to think about these z-inverse blocks in terms of actually implementing this in a computer is that each of these represents a memory storage location. I have to keep these past values. And then what I do with the values stored in each of these locations is I multiply them by some coefficient. x of n gets multiplied by b0. x of n minus 1 gets multiplied by b1. x of n minus 2 by b2 and so on. Then I add all those products up to get y of n. Now in the IAR case, I have this weighted sum of past values of the input, which I've drawn here on the left side of the diagram, but I also have a weighted sum of past values of the output. 
So if I let the value here at this node be y of n, if I delay that by one sample, I get y of n minus 1, and I delay that again, I get y of n minus 2, and so on. So to compute y of n, I have to take these past values, multiply them by the corresponding coefficient, which we're using negative a1, negative a2, negative an, and after I multiply those, I'm going to add those up and add them to the sum of the past values of the x case with the appropriate weighting. And that will give me y of n. So you can clearly see the feedback that's present here, the recursion, which is what leads to the infinite impulse response. Now this is one way to implement this system using two sets of memory banks storing past values of x and past values of y. Well, it turns out that you can actually manipulate these block diagrams in very systematic ways and come up with more efficient ways of representing these systems, especially with respect to memory storage. But that's a topic that will be explored in another lecture. So let's talk about the difference between these two types of systems in terms of what it means for filtering and filter designs. So first of all, I'm going to assume that we have a desired frequency response, hd of e to the j omega. And our goal is to come up with filters that approximate this desired frequency response. So in the FIR case, we get to choose the coefficients bk. We want to choose those so that the frequency response of the FIR filter approximates the desired frequency response, hd v to the j omega, perhaps within some tolerances. In the IIR filter, we have coefficients bk as well as ak, and we get to choose both sets of those to approximate this desired frequency response. Well, it turns out that because of the simplicity of the form of the FIR filter, namely that all of the coefficients are in the numerator, you can develop optimization methods for choosing the BK so that H of e to the j omega approximates HD of e to the j omega. What I mean by optimization is that you can do things like minimize the mean squared error between H and HD, or you can do things like minimize the maximum error between H and HD. You can set up the design problem in an optimization framework and then use numerical optimization tools to find the BKs. Well, because the IR filter has unknown parameters in the denominator, if one formulates an optimization problem trying to get h of e to the j omega to approximate hd of e to the j omega, it becomes a very difficult optimization. The presence of the ak in the denominator results in cost functions that have local maxima and so on, and it's, it's very difficult to come up with a design that one's happy with. Furthermore, one has to restrict these coefficients so that the overall filter is stable. That is, all the poles are inside the unit circle for a causal filter. So optimization methods are generally not used to design IR filters. The approaches involve taking well-known analog filter designs and transforming them from analog or continuous time filters to discrete time filters. Now, another consequence of the difference between these two types of frequency responses is that because we can formulate optimization-based design strategies, we can find FIR filters that have arbitrary magnitude and phase response. We can try to approximate arbitrary magnitude and phase responses, and the question then is just how big does M need to be to achieve a desired level of approximation? But we're talking about approximating an arbitrary magnitude response and or an arbitrary phase response. In contrast with the IR case, because we are going to take a conventional analog filter and transform it, we're going to be limited to frequency responses that are frequency selected. In other words, band pass filters, low pass filters, high pass filters, band stop filters, that sort of thing, where we have a pass band and a stop band. We don't have easy methods for designing arbitrary magnitude responses. And furthermore, we can only approximate the gain. Approximating the phase 
is just out of the realm of possibility. So we're going to come up with designs that will approximate a desired bandpass filter gain characteristic. But whatever the phase is, is what we get. We don't really have direct control over the phase. Now it turns out that with an FR filter you can obtain exactly linear phase so that these filters can be designed to have zero phase distortion. The IR filters are going to have nonlinear phase and we really don't have much control over that. Different types of analog filters will have different phase characteristics but once we select a type of analog filter the phase is out of our control. And then finally to get an acceptable FR filter design can require very large values of M because the FR filter, remember, only has zeros available for placement in the Z-plane and thus doesn't have quite as much flexibility in terms of the types of frequency responses that can be easily designed. So we may require a large value for M. In contrast, the IR filter generally requires fewer coefficients than an FR filter for comparable frequency selective filter designs. We may need, say, M to be 100, whereas here we can get away with N and M both equal to 8. That might be a typical scenario for, say, a bandpass filter of a certain frequency specification. So in practice, these are the types of considerations that guide the choice of whether to use an FIR filter or an IR filter. If one requires linear phase response, then the only option is to choose an FIR filter. If phase is not so important and you're interested in a frequency selective or bandpass, high-pass, low-pass type filter, then the IIR filters can come up with more efficient designs than the FIR filters. On the other hand, if you want to design an arbitrary magnitude response, perhaps you wish to design a differentiator, which is going to have a magnitude response that linearly increases, or some other type of filter magnitude response, then the FIR filter is the way to go. It's by far the simpler approach. So different problems have different constraints, and that will determine which of these one chooses.